Well, these objects kept coming over at the flying the same kind of formation that we fly in our fighters. Where were you flying? We were flying in Germany, and we were flying F-86s. And they would come over and do the same maneuvers that we make, except every once in a while one of them would go zip. And you just can't do that in a fighter, it's a conventional fighter. Was this on radar or was this visual? <coughs> I was on visual. You could see him from uh, what started it was the weatherman was tracking a weather balloon and he saw these objects with his binoculars. And so uh, uh, you know, that started people getting out and looking at them and then we decided to put some airplanes up and see what they were. But we couldn't get, uh, couldn't get to them. They were higher and faster. So we couldn't tell whether they were large and long ways away or whether they were smaller and closer in. It was difficult to gauge what their, exactly what their size was. They were definitely in formation. What year was this? In uh, 51, about 1951. Do you think the Russians had that kind of technology back then? No. So, um, how close would you say you might have gotten to them? I mean, you definitely determined that there were objects that I were don't under know. intelligent control, or was it? Well, yeah, they weren't just random. They were flying. Uh, they were flying fighter formations, very definitely under positive control. They're just typical uh, saucer shape, double lenticular shape, metallic looking. I think they were definitely piloted vehicles. Each one with the pilot in it, and very definitely in communication with one another because they would have flights of more than than four. They'd have flights of maybe 12 or 16. All across, and when they make a turn, they'd cross the flights in under, and they had to be in communication to be coordinated. Yeah, every once in a while, one would zip off to the side, just do a lateral man maneuver out to the side. Much as you, much as you, you've ever seen the lights, the, the UFOs that they filmed over Clear Lake, California, have you seen those film? I have. How they'll sit there in formation and all of a sudden they want to go, Shh. I think they were extraterrestrial pilots flying, no doubt about it. Well, that was, <coughs> I, was film, I was having some cameramen film the installation of a, of a precision landing facility that we were putting in right on the edge of the dry lake, and this saucer flew right over them and put down three little gear and landed out on the dry lake bed. And they went out to, uh, <clears throat> picked up their cameras and moved on out toward him filming. And he lifted off, put the gear back in the well and climbed out at a very high rate of speed and disappeared. And so while I was uh, going through all the regulation books and finding out the number to call in Washington to report it, uh, I had them go over and develop the film by the time they got back with the developed film, I was on the higher and higher and higher <coughs> level officer talking to me. Finally, with the colonel telling me to, uh, you know, when the film arrived at my desk to put it in the carrier pouch, there would be a courier there at my office by that time already, and, and they'd arrange for him to fly in our base airplane back to Washington with these films and uh, do not run prints, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we stuck them in the courier pouch. Did you watch the film? We didn't have a chance to run it. I had a chance to hold it up to the window and look at it. It was certainly a good film. Good close-up shots? Good close-up shot. Nothing like I'd ever seen. Double lenticular shape. Same. Didn't have a cupola on it or anything. It was a, pretty much the same basic shape. But this time I was involved in the research and development and doing very classified programs myself, you know, at the test center. So I knew that we didn't have any vehicles of that kind, and I was 99 or 9 tenths percent sure that the Russians didn't have any of that type either. So it certainly, there were certainly was, at that point in time, there was no doubt in my mind that this vehicle was uh, made at some other place than here on Earth. And you send it on just like you ordered to do and, uh, you know, do what they just tell you what, what they tell you to do. 
you know, I was working at the time, I was working on a little program that nobody knew about. We were not allowed to discuss with our family or discuss with anybody, and that was the U2 program. So, so it was in the same category, really. In my opinion, I think they were worried that it would panic the public if they knew that someone had vehicles that had this kind of performance way back, right after World War II, a period of time. So they started telling lies about it. And then I think they had to cover another lie, you know, tell another lie to cover their first lie, and now they don't know how to get out of it. Now it's going to be so embarrassing to admit that all these administrations have, uh, have told a lot of untruths that it's going to be embarrassing to get out of it. Do you think they want to get out of it? And um, Well, I, I think basically each and every president would probably like to get out of it, would like to come clean on the deal and not have to uh, continue to tell this truth. Eventually, when there's going to be something happen that, uh, that will make all of them have egg all over their face, and they're going to have to admit that the, you know, they haven't been truthful at all. I have a good friend who's a commercial airline pilot. He's had about uh, three different occasions where one is pulled right up alongside his wing and set in formation with him. And he's on a major airline. And, no and it, but the airline has a policy that uh, their crews don't ever talk about UFOs. McDevitt had one sighting. You know, and on each and every flight, you had your flight plan that was out in every hour, every day, hour, minute, and second. And at a certain time, particular time, if you looked at a certain degree azimuth, at a certain elevation, you would see a bright object or see some kind of an object because we track all this space debris. And so we knew where an awful lot of it would be and what you'd expect to see. But he saw this one thing shining out there that was not listed on his space debris chart. So he decided to get a picture of it. And he did. He got a picture of it, but of course it was bright metallic and you just it glinted so that all you got are just the bright glint. You can't really tell any details of what it was. And then he didn't he, he saw it for a few minutes, they tracked it, got the one picture of it, but nobody knew what it was. Well somebody's kept it pretty secret for quite a while, haven't they? Well I think the only thing that really changed my and I think everybody changed, you know, on space flight to some extent, but I think probably the biggest, uh, the biggest influence that it had was it was it's a real humbler because when you look at this beautiful big universe that God has created for us, and you realize you're about that part of it, you know, it, make, it makes you feel just about that big. Sure is, a, sure it takes one down a few notches. Actually, we were very favorably received at the UN, and Kurt Waldheim was very uh, interested, and he, he agreed that he thought it'd be a good idea to form a committee to, and to do the investigation at that level. But nothing ever got done, kind of typical of the UN, you know. It was, they talked a good game, but uh, never got around to doing anything about it. By NASA's own figures, there are some 400,000 other planets out there that could be habitable. And I just can't believe that God would habitate this one planet on and leave all these others barren. In my personal opinion, based on no facts at all, I just feel that we're out here in the hinterland of all the galaxies, or way out in the stick, and that uh, a lot of these other galaxies are closer to one another, and I think they probably have a lot of travel to and around them. And once in a while, we'll get a few travelers, stragglers, or more distant ones come through from distant other galaxies. We should form a group at the UN level to start gathering information from around the world and when you get sightings and information and investigations, actually let it be handled and coordinated from that level because there were a lot of countries that had information and there were a lot of countries like Russia is now. The government of Russia now works directly with the, the civilian UFO groups and you have a difference from country to country to country, but have all this information come together and be correlated in one place would really be a benefit to really try and determine what is real and what is fake. Just thinking about 
what we could do from a technical point of view. Some of them may be remotely operated, and they may be radio controlled, so to speak, like we call uh, unmanned piloted, un, unpiloted vehicles. Some of them may be that. I think some of them undoubtedly have crews in them and have uh, other people, and, and in my opinion, I think those people are probably very similar to us. Do you think they recovered one of those saucers that you saw? Very likely. And I think definitely there was something other than a weather balloon there. Well, I think the truth has been very submerged in all the lies that have been told. I'd like to think they reversed engineered it and did something with it. You know, did some benefit with it, which would be the logical thing to do. Is it, did you ever try to, you, did you know where that footage went of the flying saucer that landed on the tarmac? Went, went to Washington, that's all that I know. Did you ever keep in touch with anybody about it or discuss it? How would I keep in touch with anybody about it? There's no way within the military or within the government of keeping track of something that is classified unless you're directly involved in it, and I was not. So I had no way of knowing what happened to it. Was it included in part of the Project Blue Book investigation? No, it was not. And that was one of the complaints I had about Project Blue Book, which in my opinion, Project Blue Book was to totally a whitewash. There were a number of other things on Blue Book that, uh, that I hadn't had the occasion to know about that were not included in Blue Book either. Well, that was one of the reasons we did the U-2 program the way we did it, was because uh, we hadn't put no classification at all on it, because when you classify a program, then a congressman or a senator think they can go out and tell the whole details. You know, they're privileged to be able to do that. Totally trample all over security and tell the details about the whoever they want to. Didn't classify at all, and until Gary, for, until Powers was shot down, the world really didn't know about U2s, or at least in the United States. In my opinion, I think they are coming from some other planet. I think they're, there's no doubt in my mind, I think they're for real. I think eventually we'll, uh, we'll find out that there's uh, regular travel here on this earth from other planets. I think we have a lot, a lot of potential learning from them if we can just set up the, the schedule of how to go about doing it. I think they're just the just same as we are, just a little higher, a little further, and a little faster. And they can come land in my backyard anytime. If they want to come land in my backyard, I'd welcome them. To ready, so they came out to the plane. But prior to that, this just hovered over the plane for a short period of time, and then it vanished. Um, we were told later that it was picked up on radar. It wasn't as if you actually saw it glide away. It was like, like in a whisk. It was.